I'd liken it to like all the questions I'd ever had in my life were all answered and every answer pointed to love. And, and then I felt this love and it was just uh, beyond any kind of human description. Um, it was completely blissful, completely detached, no judgment, um, no conditions, eternal. It just was absolutely everything. I was it. It was all everything, ever, absolutely everything. But I couldn't tell you what everything was because I still had no reference or, or memory of humanness or, or earthliness or anything. I, I didn't recall anything about being a human being or even what a human being was. I'm here today with Krista Gorman. Krista is a physician assistant who only three weeks after graduating suffered cardiopulmonary arrest and died while in labor with her daughter. As a result, she had a transformation in her near-death experience and has come to share that with us today. Krista, thank you so much for being my guest. I'm very honored to have you here with me today. Oh, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And so take me back to what happened on this fateful day. You were getting ready for a big you know, surprise to have your baby and then something else completely happened. Yes. So this was um, coming up on 24 years ago. I was in labor with my daughter and I had just graduated my PA program. Um, like you said in the intro three weeks before and I suffered what was later uh, determined to be an amniotic fluid embolism. Um, and what that is, is it's uh, the um, amniotic fluid gets into the maternal bloodstream and then the body sees it as foreign and starts to send uh, like all sorts of cells to surround it and get rid of it. And it creates these little micro clots um, and they travel very quickly in your blood travels very quickly through your body. Um, and it traveled, these little micro clots traveled up to back to my lungs and blocked off, started to block off the peripheral lung vasculature. And I just suddenly started feeling heart palpitations because it just happens like in a split second. And my chest was fluttering and, and I looked over to my mother and, and she was sitting next to me in the labor room. And, um, and I said, I'm having trouble breathing. And the nurses just jumped into action. They were so, so amazing. Um, they knew what was going on. <laughs> they had unfortunately seen it before. And, um, and they pulled me on my left side. They pulled my mother out of the room um, put an oxygen mask on my face and started wheeling me out of the room. And they were calling code blue. I could, I remember hearing that just as my, we we're in the hallway outside my, the door going into the OR across the hall to deliver my daughter by emergency C-section. And my, I was trying to breathe. I, I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. That was the, the, I was so hyper-focused on just trying to breathe. Um, I wasn't scared. I had, I didn't know what was going on. And like I said, this happens so quickly. This is a matter of seconds, like maybe five seconds that this is all happening. And I, the last thing I remember was trying to suck air into my lungs just to get some air in. And then I felt this sense of peace sort of come over me from behind over my head and my eyes closed. And then they opened again and there had been some, some, you know, time that had passed a little bit of time that had passed between when my eyes closed in the hallway and then they opened again. And I was looking down from high above, like beyond the ceiling, some, you know, in some other realm. And I could see like a wallpaper border off to my left and and I looked down and there was there I was but I didn't know it was me I didn't have I didn't know that I had died I didn't know I was a body I didn't have any memory of 
a human life. I didn't know any, any references that we know here being human, but I could see, and I watched as these tiny black particles came racing up from the body to where my vision was. And they created this sort of loose static undulating kind of cloud. And I just recall feeling very neutral, curious, like what's going on. And I looked down again and I could see the, my doctor um, was on my left side and he had something in a blue towel and he handed it to somebody who was on my right side and they took it and turned around really quickly. And I couldn't tell what it was. And I was, I was like, oh, what is that? I want to know what that is. And I moved to the other side of my body and was looking at it from a different angle. And there was somebody at my left shoulder and he was going like this. And I later found out I had a catheter in my chest that he was, he was threading. It's called a Swan, Swan's Gans catheter. And it, it measures the pulmonary circulation during this sort of a event. Um, it just helps them to better monitor how, you know, monitor the body. Um, so he was doing that. And then I felt more curious. And as soon as I felt that curiosity sort of strengthen, I felt a tug pull to my left and I didn't want to go. I wanted, to, because I, it was like that, the, that feeling that you have when you know, the word you want to say, but you can't say it, you can't sort of find it. I felt that way about what I was observing. And as that feeling started to grow, that's when the tug came again. And I just said, okay, I'll go. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know who, who or what was tugging me, um, but I just relaxed into it. And as soon as I relaxed energetically into it, I was pulled out of the room and I went through that wall to my left. And I was in this bright white space, just a quick flash of like the brightest white you could ever imagine. And then moved into that space and then moved through another sort of indistinct opening into dense particulate dark kind of matter that I was. And I was moving like super fast. Like I can't, I wouldn't even be able to measure the speed. It's like, I just liken it to what the speed of light must be like how fast it was. And I'm just zipping along in this space. And again, still feeling quite neutral, just, you know, sort of um, like a relaxed kind of um, feeling that any of us could have while well, physical beings, just sort of hanging out and watching a movie or something, watching television or whatever, sitting on a beach. Um, and I looked to my left and I could see the dense particles. And then it became a little bit fluid at points where it was sort of like a liquidy grayish white black. And then it would become the dense particles again. And then I remember looking back like in front of me and then I came to a stop within this, this dense particulate space. And there was this download sort of like a funnel of information. And it, it seemed to happen like all at once, but it was like, doo -doo 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 -doo. and then right in front of me, like everything sort of was deduced to one thing. And that was love. And it was like the, the way that I described that experience, that part of the experience was I'd liken it to like all the questions I'd ever had in my life were all answered in every answer pointed to love. And, and then I felt this love and it was just uh, beyond any kind of human description. Um, it was completely blissful, completely detached, no judgment, um, no conditions, eternal. It just, was absolutely everything. I was it. It was all everything, ev absolutely everything. But I couldn't tell you what everything was because I still had no reference or, or memory of humanness or, or earthliness or anything. I, I didn't recall anything about being a human being or even what a human being was. 
Um, and then there was what caught my attention to my right off in the distance was this little white light. And I felt it, I felt this energy of, of it wanting me to go to it. And I wanted to go, I had no resistance at all. It was a completely non-resistant environment. And I moved towards it. And as I moved towards it, it got wider, like bigger, wider, bigger, wider. And in the opening, it was circular. And it was like a cloudy gray, uh, more white than gray. And there were these shadow figures, like humanoid, uh, in the opening. And in the front was a little boy. And the little boy had really indistinct, but had like a wide brim hat and overalls. And, he, and I would say he was about seven years old and he needed my help. And then there were adults behind him. And again, very indistinct. Like if you took a, a, a gray Sharpie and drew like a, a stick figure, that's kind of like what they look like. And there were no faces or anything. Um, and they were behind him. And he needed my help. So I, I went towards him. I wanted to help him. And again, still very neutral. There was no scariness about it. There was absolutely no fear. It was still love in all of this. And so I went into the opening and, and as I moved in, they sort of, the, the adult figure sort of fanned out a, a little distance away from me in this like white, whitish gray space. And I, I floated in and, and looked and saw them fanned out. And then I looked for the little boy, he wasn't there. And I felt that he wasn't there any longer. And then I felt they all needed my help. And I wanted to help all of them. I, that's what I was feeling back. Yes, I want to help you. So then they started to sort of dart at me and dart away, dart at me and dart away one by one. And I realized that they were taking my energy. And I felt myself very, and it was so similar to how I experienced my eyes closing before I died was, it was just like this fading away of the light. It was like, I felt myself fading, diminishing in that space in my, in my desire to help them all. And I felt, wait, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go away. You know, I don't want to disappear. And as soon as I felt that I was pulled out of there, the universe sort of answered my desire and removed me from, from that environment and back into the dense, dark particulate, particulate matter again. And I was moving along again, like imperceptibly fast, but for, for a shorter period of time, but there was no time, <laughs> but that's the word we use. Um, the experience was shorter. Um, I perceived it as being shorter. And then I went through another less sort of distinct opening than the first one. The first one was sort of like a white environment and then the particulate matter on the other side. This was sort of like a, an easing of the particulate matter away into this like gorgeous landscape where there were yellow flowers spread out in front of me. And beyond that, there were in the distance, there were these green rolling hills dotted with trees and flowers and then a blue sky and to my left there was this rock color rock uh waterfall covered with moss and to my right there was this dense evergreen forest and i just sort of merged as, as i came through the opening i just sort of like merged with all of it i was the flowers and the rocks and the waterfall and the trees and the grass and everything and it was just like this divine sort of like uh, rejoining of me with me, it felt like. And I could have existed there eternally. It was completely blissful and beautiful and everlasting. And like humanly, from a human perspective, all my needs were met. Like I couldn't have wanted for anything ever. <laughs> I could have just stayed there. And then as I felt that I was flanked on both sides by these beings that were very elongated and beige. And they were, were, they were like kind of in drapes, drapes of cloth of some sort. 
but very, again, like very indistinct. It wasn't, it wasn't really defined. Um, they didn't have distinct faces. They were energies that took this form and they were communicating to me energetically again. Um, there was no like tele, like tele, whatever, telepathic or telepathy. You know, I hear some other people who have had experiences talk about telepathy as the communication. It was everything for me was through feeling. And they felt to me, you could stay here. You could go to what comes next, or you could go back to where you came from. And they were very neutral, very supportive. They were like, like your, like your, you know, big brother or sister who is like there for you a hundred percent, like, um, no judgment loves you and wants to just, just support you. And so they communicated this to me and I had this choice to make and I, I felt, felt it through for just, you know, a brief, I don't know, second or two, maybe. And I didn't know why I was choosing, but I, I felt back, I'd like to go back. And I didn't have a reason that I knew of at that time. And as soon as I felt that, I started moving backwards through the opening. I could see the beings sort of turn to face me partially. And they communicated to me, if you go back, you need to share what you learned here. And I felt back to them, okay. And then the next thing I remember was feeling a really bad pain in my chest. Um, and then from there, I heard some like commotion around me and I found myself in this bed hooked up to machines and, um, started to take off everything. I started to, I removed the IV. I took off <laughs> the blood pressure cuff. And I climbed over the railing of the bed because I wanted to see what was going on. And they had the curtain closed. I as it was, I was in the ICU of the hospital that I would went to, to deliver my daughter. And, um, I felt my feet hit the floor and I sort of like wavered a little bit. And then I felt, okay, I'm good. And I flung the curtain open and there was my, my now ex-husband my parents, my cousins, I didn't, but I didn't know any, like recognize anybody. I just saw this group of people in a big circle huddle. And I see my dad's face pop up and he goes, whoa. <laughs> and then all of a sudden everybody was on me, getting me back into the bed. And what would, what happened was I had had an amniotic fluid embolism during labor with my daughter. And I coded, uh, my heart stopped for eight minutes is what is documented. Um, and then I went into what's called disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is when you can't clot your own blood. And I was just bleeding every, from every opening. And so I had to have several blood transfusions. Um, I, this was the day that I, my feet hit the floor was the day after this all happened. They had um, had to intubate me and induce a coma medically to stabilize me. Um, they had stopped, they had attempted CPR when my heart stopped and then had to stop CPR while they delivered my daughter by emergency C-section because I was bleeding uncontrollably. And the more they did CPR, the more I would bleed. And I would be sure to lose my life that way. Um, so for at least 90 seconds, I was told they stopped CPR and delivered my daughter. And then once they got the bleeding under control, then they restarted CPR um, and got a pulse back. So there was eight minutes of time that went by where I was pulseless. Um, I was in the ICU intubated um, for 36 hours when they were able to then extubate me because I was so stable. 
Um, so the day that I had climbed over the railing was the same day they had taken the tube out and I was breathing on my own. Um, I spent the next, then they, after that event, they moved me to my own room. So I went to a private room two days after I coded and was um, not on any cardiac monitor anymore. Um, and I was able to meet my daughter on the sixth day. Uh, when the physicians came in to tell me what happened, um, I didn't have any recall of, of my death experience yet. Um, but I was feeling, it's, it's really interesting and a little bit challenging again to find the words, but I was feeling like there was absolutely no care in the world that could touch me. There was, I had no anxiety about anything. I had no worries about anything. Um, I didn't yet understand or know what happened to me. Um, I hadn't recalled having a, a being pregnant. Um, then I would, the mind is so interesting. I would try to fill in the information and I thought I had twins. I thought I had had a boy. Um, I didn't recall that I had, I was married to my uh, husband at the time. Um, I thought he was a volunteer at the hospital because he was always there. And so by the sixth day, when I first got to hold my daughter, um, I was, I was more present. And when I held her for the first time, it was like, I had already, I felt like I'd already met her. Like this was not the first time. And I had, I was sort of putting on a show for everybody. I was counting her toes because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. And, um, you know, kind of like bouncing her a little bit next to me. Um, but it, what was going on internally was, was something completely different than what my family observed, which was my face was very um, blank and I wasn't really reactive to anything. But inside, I was perfectly content and perfectly happy, and just, um, I just felt so like joyful and like everything was great in the world. Everything was perfect. There was no nothing to be concerned about. Um, so it it took a while for me to sort of come back from that. Uh, it took months and months, and during that period of time was when my experience came to me during sleep. I literally woke up from the most uh, hyper real vivid experience in a in a dream state that I'd ever had. It was more real than me talking to you now or looking around my place. It was, it was realer than real and it was my experience. And I was, I woke up a completely different person. Um, I had already been very different up until that point, but now I had an explanation for it because I was very type A and like, you know, PA, I was like, I had to know everything and, and I was so driven and I wanted it all. I wanted to, you know, I got married my first year of PA school. I had it, I got pregnant my second year. I had my daughter just after I graduated, I had it all planned out. And then I woke up and I was like this other person, just very, like, I just want to like, love everybody and like share love and, and, um, no, there's nothing to be worried about. Like everything's okay. And, and yeah, just so much had changed about me. Um, I was still Krista as I was in my death. I was still Krista, but without the name, but I was my consciousness as I know myself within my body and in sort of in my head um, to be. And so that, that, that entity, that energy came back, but all of the attachments to everything out here, not, that did not come back. Um, so it's, and it's been it's coming up on 24 years now. Um, so that's, that's the, 
that's really the the meat and potatoes of my actual experience. It was a very profound experience as well. And I'm sure kind of challenged you. Did it challenge you in living in this physical world, um, moving back into these spaces where we have to rely on money and paying bills and things like that? Oh, yes. It's so heavy, so heavy compared to the realm I was in. Uh, completely different. And yeah, it's, it seems so mundane. You know, it seems so unnecessary. <laughs> like we have the ability to exist in this realm, on this earth, with so much more lightness, and peace, and happiness, and joy, and love, love at the foundation of it all and encompassing it all. We have that ability to do that. And yet we choose collectively as humans to create all this drama and chaos and difficulty and strife. While at the same time, it's ultimately, that's our journey. Like that's why we chose to come here and experience this human form and, you know, have those bills to pay so that we could grow in greater and greater love. We can understand the contrast. Yeah. And focus on something better. Where do you think you were when you died, when your heart stopped? Were you in heaven or was it another, just another dimension? Are there words for it? Yeah, it's, well, I, you know, I've never given it words. I call it my heaven. And I, I was raised Catholic. I don't adhere to any specific religion, but um, I, I like the, I like how the word heaven feels. So I, I gauge myself by feeling like, how does this feel? How does that feel? You know, I like how heaven feels to me. And I, and I've said it before, like when my daughter and I were on Morgan Freeman's uh, story of God back in 2017, that was aired initially, but he said, was it, was it heaven to you? And I said, it, it was, it was my heaven. We each have our own individual heaven. We, and this is my experience. Again, this is not everybody's reality or everybody's truth. This is my truth that, that I co-created my experience with the greater universe, which is love. And this, and I later found out 10 years later, what that force was in my experience that was working with me too like sort of interspersed with the love. And that was the quote unquote law of attraction. Like these, like the, the, the individuals that speak about law of attraction, they know like they, that is it. That is an, a predominant energy of the universe. And, and it, it is working within us, around us all the time. And we can use that energy to create our lives. We're creative. That's what we came here to be is these creative beings and to have fun and enjoy and love and, and recognize the beauty and the majesty and be in awe and have that feeling, you know, it's like, that's why we came here. When you were on the other side, you saw this kind of beautiful waterfall covered in moss and a forest. Mm -hmm. And you said that you became everything. Mm -hmm. And then you also said that you retained your sense of Krista. When you became everything, were you still Krista? I was less, less so like, I felt, it's interesting. I felt this oneness while while still having a sense of mm, not separateness, but I sort of, sort of like of still being like an entity as well. Um, yeah. So it, it was like, I don't know what I could liken it to here. I sort I guess it's sort of like being on a team and knowing that you're part of this group or family, you're a part of this family, but still being your own individual. Um, the, <laughs> it's like, but it, it was like the nature that was there that I was reabsorbed sort of into was 
far more powerful than, than I, than I, it was, it was far more powerful in a, in a healthy, positive way. Yeah. Would you say that you are kind of everything here in this dimension as well? Yes, absolutely. And we don't, you know, when we don't see it, we don't recognize it because we um, walk with shoes on, on the earth. We separate ourselves from the earth in so many ways. Um, so nature, this is a big, a big part of who I am. Um, nature is the most powerful healing element that we can expose ourselves to. And it's right outside our door for most people, for a lot of people, not maybe not most, but for many, many people, it's right there and we walk right by it. <laughs> we, we keep our shoes on and we don't connect. There's, I mean, if you look at this, this, the, you know, science of, um, of actually like they call it earthing, but there's science behind it that shows the movement of electrons from the earth into the feet at the proportion at which the body requires it, needs it, is depleted in electrons. And those electrons help to balance, put us into hemo, uh, homeostasis. And it actually helps to heal peripheral vascular disease in people. Um, now I live in Southwest Florida. There's a lot of old people here. I'm a PA. I see a lot of old people every day. I treat their peripheral vascular disease. And the one thing I tell my patients is get outside in bare feet. Make sure you're not stepping on anything sharp so you get a wound, but go outside and put your feet on the, on the grass. 10 minutes, go stand outside. You're, you will begin to heal better. You know, um, you'll feel better. It's, we, uh, once we, you know, and we're moving, I feel like collectively the world is moving closer to recognizing the power that the earth has in terms of its healing ability for us and our connectedness, just interconnectedness to it, inextricable connectedness to nature. Um, that once we, we sort of get to that critical mass, that tipping point where more, where there's more people who believe and recognize and understand and appreciate and honor that connection, then don't, then, you know, we'll have a much healthier, happier human race on this earth, more connected. I like how you bring up that kind of shift that's happening where we're realizing the power or the energy of the earth. And do you think that in general, everybody is starting to wake up, not everybody, but slowly, people are starting to wake up more and more. Yeah. And I feel like it's more supported these days. You know, when I was 13 years old, I shaved my head and I had this little hunk of hair. It was like in the eighties and this little hunk of hair right here. And I teased it and I colored it with Kool-Aid and I thought it was so cool. And I moved from California to upstate New York at that time. And I started at a school. I was in ninth grade and I was the outlier and I didn't realize that that was going to happen to me as a, as a teenager I, in California. That's what all the kids were doing. You know, we were all expressing ourselves and now if I did something like that, I would be looked at as, Oh, that is, that's so cute. You know, like, Oh, I love how, you know, that's so funky. You're so funky. It's, it's so much more widely accepted. And I, and I just, I just feel that, the more people who talk about this stuff, who talk about, you know, dying and coming back and having this amazing experience and the power of love and nature and, and, you know, the, the healing power of love in nature, as we talk about that more and social media is the excellent tool to, to expose oneself or to seek out others who are in that community. Um, and we connect and we talk and we talk more and we talk more, we're bringing all that into us and the evolution of, of the human race is, is what it is. It's been the same over millennia. We will, we are evolving more towards, um, a 
a sort of collective consciousness that is that has love at the forefront um we're moving towards that even if and you know some people would be oh yeah sure yeah no no we're not no we're not have you seen the news have you watched the news kind of thing and and my answer to to the naysayer would be remove your attention from the things that support what you currently believe if you want to believe something else if you want to believe something that feels better if you want to believe something that feels more true to you then remove your attention from the things that don't support that and put your attention on things that do and you will help grow more love in the world just by doing that it changes our vibration and that vibration is picked up we can measure it again scientifically it's picked up by people beings everything plants trees around us everything everything is vibration physics has taught, taught us that we see something that's solid we know it's not really solid it's atoms and there's mostly empty space that's what we're taught yet that table feels feels hard that's real that's a real table well in in at the, from this point of view yes it is I love that quantum physics is starting to catch up with spirituality um, mm -hmm. and it's kind of been coming together for the past few decades and like you said now it's kind of accelerating do you think we're moving into a whole new age where people are going to be more enlightened more loving more caring there's going to be less wars more peace on earth um, or do you think there's an event coming that we're getting ready for well i think it's a little bit of both um and, and then again this is my this is my uh understanding based on my own knowledge understanding of the things that i'm observing out here in the world and then how it feels within my body when i consider it so one thing that we that is rapidly changing is we are moving towards a quantum financial system and that's something like like i'm a I'm a behavior scientist. You know, I, I had my degree, my undergrad was in psychology and I worked in mental health for years before I became a PA and, and really like took that deep dive into the hard sciences. But so I have like perspective of both. And when I first heard about a quantum financial system, I was like, oh, what's that? And I started to investigate. Well, as it turns out, yes, we are, we're moving towards towards digital currency. And if you think about the words, currency, currency is energy. It's just exchanges of energy. Money is exchange of energy, but it's becoming less centralized and more in the hands of the everyday retail person, investor, so that we have more control over our destiny ultimately. Um, it's not being dictated to us so much. Well, to embrace that and to to really, you know, take advantage is is a positive thing um, for for a person to do for themselves. I feel it's it helps to create that feeling of openness of of being a little more sovereign in your life. Um, you know, ultimately, studies show that that the happiest people are those that that perceive that they have control over their daily lives and a quantum financial system will help to bring that like more concretely to a broader group of people um and to me that alone will help to bring us all closer together as human beings because it will help to free us up from the the you know the everyday concern of the of the human being which is i've got to go to work and pay my bills and take care of my kids you know etc um so it's my belief that 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 transformation has been happening for a while just sort of behind the scenes but now it's coming into more into the forefront more into manifestation and it will help to open all of us up along with the social media kind of coming in and people you know people can be can be really beautiful on social media 
as equally, they can be really ugly on social media. But I believe that the beautiful people far outweigh the, the ugly, ugly ones. And the ugly ones are, are the ones who are suffering the most and need the most love from all of us. So, you know, that the coupled with social media, the, this, this changing sort of um, environment that we're, we're living in, in terms of um, how we, how we function in the world, um, I think is going to collectively as, as human beings on this earth, bring us closer together and bring us closer to nature. Where will there be there be some things along the way that are painful? Yes. I don't know exactly what they are. I'm not, I don't, I'm not um, psychic in that way. Um, I have a clear sentience. Like I, I feel when I feel something that I feel is true, like that is, that is true. Like I, I know it with every fiber of my being, but I don't go announcing it and I don't push it on people. Um, I just function that way in my life. And, and I just make choices based on that for myself and my family. Um, but I collectively, I, and I'm an Aquarian, so I'm all about the, the collective. Collectively, I, I do feel very strongly that there, there's going to rise a large group of individuals that work together for the betterment of humanity. And it will be, ultimately, it will not be a secret. Maybe in the beginning, it will be a little bit of a secret. They'll be kind of working behind the scenes helping people, supporting people, making this world a better place to live. But ultimately it's gonna be, it's gonna grow to be so large that it's not gonna be hidden anymore. <laughs> and it's just gonna be like this known thing like, oh yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's part, they're part of that whatever group and, and they're here to do whatever to help. And um, that, that's my vision for this earth and it, it will happen in my lifetime. I know it will. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> That's how I feel very, very deeply. Yeah. <laughs> and you said that you have this clairsentience gift. Is it something that you brought back from your near death experience? I, I feel that it, it's something that was um, like exponentially strengthened from it. Um, but I had to have this like ego death after my NDE um that was required for me to bring it more into my beingness um and my nde really helped my nde was has is always has always been the touch point for me of okay love divine love i am love everything's love okay how do i bring that into this how do i how do i bring that into my body and create that and that's when in 2010, I, where I really, really like opened myself up to, okay, like my near death experience was always there, but I, I was trying to function in this world and I just couldn't fully. And I was, I was just, I had lost myself and I was losing more of myself and so unhappy. And I'm like, I know I need to be the love. How do I be the love? How do I be that love? Um, so I started meditating and um, I started reading i read a new earth by eckhart tolle and and that helped me to understand my ego better and what ultimately ultimately i what was required for me was to love myself be before um giving myself away to others and that's what the shadow beings taught me in my nde too was that i had to choose me first and i had i had a psychic person i was talking to at one of the iams conferences who said to me, you created that, didn't you? And I said, yes. And they said, what a, what a beautiful, beautiful message for yourself. <laughs> and, and I said, it was, it was just what I needed because I would give to you long before I would give to myself. I would choose you first over me. I would, I would die for somebody before I, you know, it's like that ultimate sacrifice that the hero makes in the films whatever stories but but that is an example of the innate connection we have the unspoken just 
it's just there and you can't not have it there to some degree is that connection we all have to one another it's in, again inextricable we're all connected and it's through the heart that we're connected uh, you make a really great point about how we have to take care of ourselves yeah. if you can't pour from an empty cup that's an old saying and kind mm -hmm. of cliche but it's very true mm -hmm. uh, so i'm glad that you brought that up and you said that you're able to kind of access this realm these feelings still by going into meditation is this something that anybody can do yes anybody can we can all have like a near-death experience energy here in the body we can all have that experience it's just a matter of letting the ego take a back seat and coming from that place of love in our thoughts, our actions. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a, sounds like a Nirvana kind of like, oh yeah, that's like, that's nice to talk about, but that's not reality, you know, and that is true to a point because we are these dense physical beings, but we can have that lightness of being that comes when we are just flowing with life, just flowing staying staying in that space of love as opposed to fear and the two are required you know the two are absolutely required in this realm for us to accomplish what we came here to accomplish as these spirit beings and these physical bodies and then when we're when we're done with our assignment whatever it is or with our with our job here then we we transition and we transition to another realm and we choose where we're going to go and have whatever experience we have there. Do we come here or are there other places that we go, other realms, dimensions? Well, it's my understanding that we always have the choice to come back, but we also have like a spirit, not a spiritual council, but like there's other entities involved in helping us to make that choice. Um, we're never alone. That's, that's another important piece that listeners really need to, they really need to like embody that feeling too. We are never alone. We always have higher beings that are there in an instant, split second. All we have to do is say, I need help. I need help. And they're there. And I had an experience when I was, and I talk about it in my, my book, I died and learned how to live where when I was about three or three, or four years old, I was in my bedroom. I was just a little thing. And and I played by myself a lot because my mom, uh, I had an older brother, a couple years older than me. And then when I was about three, four, my mother was pregnant with my younger brother. And so, and she, you know, it was the seventies and she was doing housework or whatever, or laying down. And, um, and I was by myself in my bedroom and I was lonely and I wanted somebody to play with. And all of a sudden I felt this energy there. And I felt it was by my closet door and I looked and there was no person there, but I felt like it was like a somebody. And they felt to me like their love, their unconditional love. And I felt it. And, and then I was like, well, like my mom and dad. And, and they felt back, no, not like, this is not like your mom and dad. You already have a mom and dad. This is like my love for you. And like support and just, just like unending support. And any, and I felt that them communicate anytime you need me, I'll be here. So, and then they went away and I, and I think I got up and I went outside to look for somebody to play with like one of the neighbor kids or something. And I remember dancing in our den, dancing to like Sesame street or something. And, and there they were the, the, the angel up in the corner watching me dance. And anytime I thought about them, they would be there. And then I recall, this was years later, I hadn't thought about them for a while. And I was like, oh, if I think about them, I wonder if they'll still come. And I thought about them. And I remember looking out my window at the clouds and, and they didn't come in the night. I was like, I, I thought harder. I felt harder. Like, I want you to come. And they showed up and they were like right on my right side and they moved to the center of me and they said, you have everything you need right here. You don't need me anymore. And I'm like, oh, okay, that feels good. And then I was, I never thought about him again. And it didn't, I didn't remember this until I was 
in my 20s, I remembered this entity that was there. And then, you know, years later, when I, when I started to explore my NDE more and integrate it into my life, I started reading about archangels and I realized that it was Archangel Michael that was visiting me. And <laughs> it's just, I mean, to talk about it, it's like, like, oh my God, but, but it was just, that's just the way it was as a child. It was like, okay, no big deal. But they're there. They're all we have to do is ask for them to show up. How has your experience shifted your perception of who you really are? Oh, completely. Oh, it's like deepened, deepened, deepened who I know I am, what I am. And it's connected me with other humans in a way that I was never connected before. I care about people. Yeah, absolutely. Am I a helping person? Absolutely. I sought out those professions my whole life, but, but now it's like, there's this depth of, of really being this mm, divine being in this physical body and, um, and just seeking out ways to, to serve and to, um, also like first serve myself, um, more so now than ever in my life, like literally making decisions that would benefit me over making decisions that would benefit you and being okay with that and not closed off to other ideas, but does this serve me? Does this thing serve me? Okay. Yes, it does. Okay. Then let's move forward. If, does this completely serve me? Do I feel completely grounded in this saying yes to this? No, there's something that's holding me back. Okay. Let's not make a decision. Let's explore that a little bit and we'll revisit the decision at a time when I'm feeling like I am ready to, you know, and, and things start, you know, go over here and things start playing out. Just information comes to you, you know, things happen out here and you're like, oh, that gives me more clarity about this. And then you can sort of flow and move and make that decision that you weren't quite ready to make last week. And that's just one like sort of general example, but we can flow in life that way. We don't have to intently be like, oh, I got to have this like this and this like this and this like that. And then I can make a decision or, and then I can move forward. No, it doesn't have to be that way. You can choose for it to be, you know, challenging and difficult if you want it to, but it doesn't have to be. And we're always supportive. Are you afraid of death? No. <laughs> you know, there's a Woody Allen that, saying that I quote, and I, people can feel how they feel about Woody Allen, but this is like the best quote ever. I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> it's like, and, and, it, and, you know, Joseph Campbell, I quote him a lot too. He says he, and he's quoting someone else, you know, when the angel of death approaches, it's terrifying, but when it reaches you, it's bliss. And for me in my death, I wasn't terrified. I was intent and I was focused on breathing. But when that peace came over me, it was bliss. And it was bliss from there on out. That's very comforting. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Krista, if my viewers wanted to reach out to you, how can they find you? Um, I'm on various social media platforms. I'm on uh, Instagram, uh, Krista, just Krista Gorman, I think is my handle, 717. Um, I, and I have an email 12 principles at gmail.com that people can reach me at that, at, uh, the email. And then I also have a blog that I unfortunately tend to neglect, but I do get messages through there. Um, and that's kristagorman.com. If you had one message that you would hope the audience would take away from today's conversation, what would it be? The ultimate, the ultimate purpose of us existing in these bodies is to love period everything else is you know is is like sort of you know in addition to that is the enjoyments of being in the physical realm but we're here to love each other and when we can really really do that well <laughs> ourselves first and then others this this whole this whole world will change for the for the better 
Absolutely. I love that. Thank you so much, Krista, for being my guest today. This has been so wonderful and enlightening for me. I appreciate you very much. Thanks so much for having me and giving me a platform to share this stuff. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and supporting my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing if you enjoy near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative stories. It helps the algorithm know that this information is useful and push it out to more people. And that's the goal, to get as many people to know that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we never die. Our bodies might die, but our essence will never die. And I want people to live with less fear. Let's all spread the word, like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that little notification bell so you get all the notifications when my videos post. Thank you for all of your support. I'm sending love to you.